Chapter 8 Barsak It was nearing six o'clock in the evening, too late to drive all the way back up to Yorkshire. More's the point, I was ravenous. The day's altercations had zapped all of my reserves and I was desperately in need of fuel. I'd treat the lads to a state a nice country gaff. The drinks would be on me, or someone yet to be decided. I told the lads we'd stop over at a nice little country inn I'd seen the signs for on the way down. The white art country inn in Fullbourne on the outskirts of Cambridge. We'd skirted past it on the way down, and even the road signs told me it was the kind of place frequented by travelling businessmen, a place you only stayed when some other poor bastard was footing the bill. Don't worry, I'll sort the bill. The lads jumped at the chance. It was rare they'd ever slept outside their own beds. Lads like these from the backwaters of Barnsley weren't so well travelled. We meandered along narrow country roads, crossed a rickety old out-of-service toll bridge, and then zigzagged again for miles through the countryside along narrow lanes until we finally arrived at an unmade private road. I'd followed the signs for the country retreat to the letter, but I'm sure we hadn't taken the quickest or most efficient route there, though definitely the most discreet one. If by chance there'd been a patrol car out looking for us, it wouldn't be round here. For the first time I hadn't a clue where we were at all. It could have been another country, because the weather was ten degrees warmer than when we'd set off from Yorkshire, and there wasn't a sign the cruel winter mistress had ever lived in this part of the world. We landed at the inn about an hour later. It was a nicely polished gaff, with fitted carpets and clean ashtrays. The kind of place frequented by travelling salesmen, retired call board directors, Freemasons and anyone else with a couple of quid more than the next man. The owner was a consumptive-looking fella who could have easily been an ex-miner who'd taken it on for health reasons. He was a tall, bulky man, but his head was too small to be in proportion with his lumbering shoulders. Assets beneficial in a rugby scrum, but not much use for outfoxing a trio of travelling crooks. I pulled out a wad of cash and asked the landlord how much he wanted for two rooms for the night. He said it was no problem, to relax and that we should settle up the next day before we left. That was his first and most critical mistake. I took a master suite and left the two potential lovers to share a modest twin room, keeping expenses to a minimum for Wiggly's sake. I'd booked us in using my theatrical airs and graces and my stage name for the day, Mr Jack Keerford. He was another lunatic from the Barnsley area, and I figured these two pillocks might find it easier to remember a name they already knew. Some task for a couple of lads who appeared to have handed in their brains at birth. Keerford had a barrel chest and was a local hard man. He was a very pleasant man, fit for his age, shaped like a barrel, but had no fat on him. He'd done plenty of time in the shovel during his life, just like me. The Keerfords were a large family who were interrelated with the travellers and much feared in the Barnsley area. Jack used to go out in Wakefield on weeknights and then walk back to Grimethorpe. On the way home he'd try house doors and commit burglaries and a couple of times he'd come unstuck. On another occasion he was hauled up in a pub and the police came to drag him out. Because of his reputation and being well known for fighting with the police, they'd sent in a German shepherd to flush him out. Jack grabbed the dog and strangled it, then threw it out the door. We'd booked in, checked out our rooms, and after a quick wash, wandered back down to the hotel bar. I pulled out a wad of cash for sure, like it came as easily as the air we breathed, and asked should we pay now or clear the bill upon exit, knowing that my aim was to achieve the latter. My empty gesture relaxed the owner, and he gave me the standard reply. Please, pay when you check out and enjoy your stay. Grinning from ear to ear, and showing a row of lovely white teeth in delight to confirm it. His eyes were dancing like gas jets on low at the thought of the midweek custom, and mine were doing exactly the same, though I tried my best to contain it. Mission accomplished. I thought there was no way I was footing the bill for all three of us if I could find a way not to. Over in the bar I continued to keep my money on shore, maintaining the air of viability for the night. It was simple really if you had the gift of the gab, and I had. I didn't need a script, swindling was in my blood. After about my second pint of beer I spotted a bottle of vintage South African mountain wine on the shelf behind the bar. 
I knew the value of most wines, and this one would be approximately 2,500 South African rand back in Lagos by my reckoning. I asked how much it was to buy, as I wanted it for me and my companions, not that the price was relevant. Not a great taste in wine in all honesty, but I still wanted value for the arrogant prick's money. It was £300, which I agreed to pay, and reassured the manager that it was actually reasonable given the bouquet and year. We continued to enjoy a steak dinner, copious drinks and a few cumbersome cigars, all racking up nicely on the bill. I could only eat enough to fill me generally. All the years of living on a starvation diet in the nick had limited what my stomach could hold to that of the average ten-year-old. To overcome the problem, I'd eat a little bit about every three hours at home, but I wasn't at home. The other two clearly didn't share my affliction. Paul, this isn't going to end well, you know that. Shippy pleaded. A game plan had never been discussed, but he knew me too well. Don't worry, Col, I assured him. And stop calling me fucking Paul, you ruin our cover. And then casually blew a cloud of expensive cigar smoke over his head, a smile now fixed irritably on my face. Wiggly was on the back foot, desperately trying to keep his wits about him but Shippy didn't have the intelligence or concentration span to maintain the charade all night. Whenever he messed up, I pulled a discerning face in the direction of Wiggly and made sure the owner clocked the fact that I had no respect for my pal and his blatant stupidity, regardless of the reason. The other two retained well-practiced, gormless smiles. They lacked the wit to involve themselves too much in what was taking place. I kept my money on the table throughout the night so that the owner didn't bat an eyelid or act wary of the travelling scallies who'd checked in. Every now and then I interjected a flamboyant story of either business or property, the manager swivelling his head like a submarine periscope at the mere mention of money. He was more than happy at our rate of spending. He worshipped the ground that Jack Keirford walked on. We'd spent the entire evening in the public bar of the hotel, it was one of the most entertaining evenings of my life. Old Wiggly laughed like never before. He had a laugh that could be heard on the mainland. A real old ha 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 belly laugh that made people smile just to hear him. A stunner at the bar captivated the local fellas with a book some good looks and occasional sarky comments. I was beginning to like her more by the hour, probably brought on by the bar sack, but I had no time to fall in love tonight. She had the glamorous air of my Wendy, but not the finesse required to carry it off. Shippy interjected now and then with an old story, always one I'd heard before, and laughing like a demented hyena at his own anecdotes. The owner looked on. His face was inscrutable and reminded me of a traffic warden's when caught slipping a parking ticket under a windscreen wiper as he tallied up the bill behind the bar after each and every round. Retaining a wry grin like he was the one having me over, He'd probably only paid a hundred quid for that South African vintage and was grinning like a Cheshire cat inside at the profit he'd clear on our twenty minutes of its meagre enjoyment. Night all, see you in the morning to settle up, I announced to the few staff remaining. As a parting gesture I looked deep into the manager's yellow flecked eyes and shook his hand. I could detect a hint of mockery, a sort of horizontal limey reflection. He'd been into us like a used car salesman. Nothing was too much trouble. He prayed we'd empty the place. He'd think differently come tomorrow morning. I hated people like him, thinking they were a cut above a peckerhead like me. Those and a dozen other indications to his character caused me to dislike him, but by far the worst was the way he genuinely thought I was daft. He thought everybody was daft, but no particular group of people were dafter than those up north. His nose slipped into third gear at the mere mention of money. He thought I was daft, and no matter what I said, I'd never alter that fact. In my back pocket I just happened to have some excellent Nigerian bush, which I'd acquired to help me forget about the pressure I was under. I didn't smoke it generally, but since the Wilson incident I'd started doing lots of things I'd not done before. Skinning up out the back on my way to my room, I asked if the lads would like some. The glutton that was Wiggly spluttered, unable to form his words quick enough for shock, and shook his head so hard the dewlap swinging under his chins blew the match out. He was dead against it. It was just another risk that didn't need taking in his eyes.
Shippy, a seasoned smoker, said, I don't mind if I do, as nice as you please. I passed Shippy what pathetic remains were left of the joint, and would bet my life he'd be left holding it and not me if a passing policeman came by. So after several pints, an expensive bottle of South African mountain wine, and a three-skinner of Nigerian bush, I headed back to my room destined for deep sleep. Right, Paul, Wiggly called over. See you in morning. Shippy concluded on his behalf. In that instant, the devil told me to fuck him off and drive straight home with the day's takings and drop him well and truly in the shit, but that soon passed. In my circles, even I wasn't above a bullet. Another evil thought had been quelled. I needed a clear head and all my wits about me to work in the morning. The expensive wine had helped. As I undressed, my mind went into overdrive with a series of rapidly changing thoughts, the conclusion being I was at last making people happy instead of miserable by leaving the country, even the coppers. Bomf. I'd collapsed on the bed in a drunken heap, snoring away like a Kawasaki 500, just like my pal Big Mick Sellers had been doing for donkey's years. I'd made sure I slept with the aid of some little green pills called your hypnos, a mild sedative. Three plus two plus five, in that order, to make sure I slept like a log. It was magic. I hadn't been sleeping well of late. Always a lot of worry on my mind. But with these things I could close my eyes and sleep at will. Sleeping was never difficult with Dr McGill's five little green pills, and I awoke bright as a button around my usual time, or near enough. 5am. It was 4.40am to be precise. There wasn't anything unusual in me waking so early. I'd been doing it for years, ever since I could remember. Rat-a-tat-tat. I rattled Shippy and Wiggly's room door. I'd made them share on the off chance I'd have to cover the bill, keeping expenses to a minimum. For Wiggly's sake, I reminded myself. It was now 5am dead. Shippy opened the door, bleary-eyed. Not me. I'd always made it a point to be up and ready, washed and shaved and full of life, the same tactics that scared most prison officers to death. It had crossed my mind again five minutes before to leave these two here to pick up the tab themselves and drive straight to the airport. Fuck my life. When would these type of thoughts stop? Get dressed, we're off, I ordered. What? He replied, still half comatose. I've checked us out. Get your shit, we're off. I continued the fanny. Keep the noise down. We don't want to wake any of the other guests. I'll meet you at the bottom of the stairs. The tales continued to roll off my tongue like a master storyteller. The lads tiptoed down. I'm sure they'd wised up by now, but they'd have to keep quiet all the same. If any of the other guests or staff woke up, they'd be made to fear for their lives, ensuring that we left without obstruction. Everything went to plan, apart from a brief encounter with a scrawny-looking young night porter on the way out. I told him in no uncertain terms to keep his mouth shut, or I'd be back to petrol bomb the place. We left without paying a single penny. Moments later, the Volvo was cutting its way through the tarmac like a Learjet. At this rate, we'd be home before anybody was out of bed, but it'd probably be in need of another new gearbox and engine in a week or so's time. The car came home like it had gone, and I didn't even have to refill the tank. You took a right liberty there, Sykesy, Shippy said, giving the impression he'd be grateful if I'd stopped taking such liberties. I elected not to mention the two sets of sheets and pillowcase I had in my case. That might just push him over the edge. He was right, though. The police would have a right field day with a little scandal like that. As it was, they were giving me all the aggravation they could, and I wasn't doing anything wrong.' 